An electric spark is passed continuously through a mixture of gases such as may have made up the atmosphere when the Earth was new over 4,000 million years ago. Water vapor is present. The sparks simulate the electrical storms which raged for vast periods of time. Slowly, more and more complex molecules containing carbon are built up. In the bottom of the apparatus they collect. They include complicated organic compounds which are the building bricks from which living organisms build up their even more complex constituents. This primeval soup may have been formed in our ancient oceans. It could have generated the earliest life from which in turn has evolved the enormous variety of animal and plant life on Earth today. In this series of films, we shall be looking at some of the evidence which suggests how the process may have happened, and may still be happening. We shall be examining some of the evidence for the theory of evolution. Dawn over the Grand Canyon, Arizona, USA. A mile down to the Colorado River, which cuts along the inner gorge and 10 miles wide. Let's look at the kinds of process which created over many millions of years this tremendous gorge. The rocks in the inner gorge were once crushed and distorted into mountains by tremendous earth forces. Then they were gradually worn down by erosion. The sea flooded in. Rivers carried sediments into this calm ocean, which were deposited on the seabed to form eventually a consolidated layer of sedimentary rocks. Then, slow earth movements raise the rock above the sea. The earth is never still. After millions of years, the level dropped again, and once more a calm sea brought sediments, eventually forming a new deposit of a different rock. The sea retreated again. Sometimes, the layer of rock just laid down was eroded away by wind and rain. Then the sea returned again after millions of years and a different rock was deposited. Remains of some of the living things existing at the time were trapped in all these sediments and preserved as fossils, not just in the Grand Canyon, but anywhere in the world where sedimentary rocks were laid down. The process continued until many layers had been formed, a huge ladder of time with the oldest rock at the bottom and the youngest at the top. Now, a slow, gentle earth movement lifted the entire land mass so that the sea fell away. At the same time, a great river, the Colorado, started to cut down into the rocks, like a knife passing through a gigantic layer cake. The process is still going on today. And now, the river has reached and cut into those oldest rocks right at the bottom of the canyon, so that many layers of sedimentary rock are exposed along its walls. Let's look at some fossils found in different layers. The river is at present cutting through the Precambrian rocks of the inner gorge, tilted from the time when they were forced up into great mountains. From these rocks, traces of fossil algae very primitive plants have been collected. This is how it may have looked in those times. The algae floated on the water surface. Climbing upwards, like those distant mule riders who have clambered out of the inner gorge, we reach sedimentary rocks laid down nearly 600 million years ago. They're exposed at the foot of the outer wall of the canyon, in the bottom right there. Fossil casts of primitive annelid worms have been found here. 
and the marks left by trilobites. At this time, the Cambrian period, a shallow sea covered the area. Higher up, we reach Devonian rocks, laid down about 410 million years ago when this plated fish lived in the sea. Higher still, a limestone layer containing fossilized colonial corals, again telling us of invasion by the sea. From the late Carboniferous, 300 million years ago, a fossil conifer, a much more complex plant than those early algae. Permian sandstone, 250 million years old. Here, on the side of a fallen boulder, animal tracks. The fossilized footprints of an early reptile. Then, the landscape must have looked much like this. Another fossilized track from the same period. Arthropods such as scorpions were living then. Further up the side of the canyon, towards younger layers of rock. The Kaibab limestone, about 230 million years old. At this period, the sea again left its evidence. Fossil brachiopods, or lamp shells. You can see the two valves. And a complete fossil removed from the rock. We're now at the canyon rim, but there were once rocks above this, laid down even more recently, although still many millions of years ago. Here they've been eroded away by the weather, except for the odd butte, as it's called, like this one. However, these newer rocks from the Mesozoic era can be found in the painted desert of northern Arizona. In these rocks we find evidence of far more complex animals. These are dinosaur footprints, the foreleg, the huge hind foot, and the marks left by its claws. Claws like these. Listen to a geologist who works in the Grand Canyon, William Breed. It is difficult for a geologist to look at these rocks and not to believe in evolution. For at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, where the rocks are old, we only find very primitive algal deposits. And then as we go up the layers from older to younger, we see first trilobites, then fish, then amphibians, and then reptiles. And this is an evolutionary sequence from a more simple animal to a more complex animal. Here at the University Museum, Oxford, in 1860, there was the famous row with Bishop Wilberforce about evolution. Today, in the nearby Department of Geology and Mineralogy, the probable ages of rocks and of the Earth are being determined by modern physical techniques. A numbered rock sample is first split by applying very high pressure in a specially designed machine. It's broken down further using a hand-operated tool. Then, further still, in a sort of rock mincer. Then finally, to a very fine powder indeed. This rock, like many, contains a radioactive isotope which slowly decays over hundreds of thousands of years to form another element. By measuring how much decay is taking place, we can work out the age of the rock. 
The radioactive isotope in this rock is rubidium-87, which decays by losing a beta particle to form strontium-87. If we can find out how much strontium-87 has been formed and how much rubidium-87 is left, we can work out the age of the rock, because we know the rate at which rubidium-87 breaks down. But rocks contain other isotopes of strontium as well, so we must find out how much of the total strontium is strontium-87. The rubidium and total strontium in the rock are determined by X-ray fluorescence, a standard technique. Then the metals present in several different samples to allow for error are converted into soluble chlorides and the strontium is separated out using an ion exchange column. Even tiny amounts of strontium can be separated out in this way. This is the fraction containing the strontium chloride and it is evaporated down until it forms only a smear inside the little tube. A mass spectrometer is now used to find out the proportion of strontium-87 present formed by decay of the rubidium-87. First, the samples must be mounted on tantalum filaments. A drop of phosphoric acid is placed on first as a sort of flux. The smear of strontium chloride is then dissolved in absolutely pure water. and a drop of solution is placed on the flux. The filament is heated electrically, the water evaporates and strontium chloride is left as a deposit on the filament. The filament, along with others, is placed in the mass spectrometer, the interior of which is evacuated. On applying a current, it heats up, and positive strontium ions stream off the filament along the spectrometer tube. There's a bend in the tube where an electromagnet applies a steadily changing magnetic field. This deflects the ions round the bend, but the degree of deflection depends on the different masses of the ions. So different groups of ions in turn, different isotopes, hit a target at the end of the tube as the magnetic field changes. Each group of ions produces a tiny current which is amplified and measured and is proportional to the amount of each isotope present. The meter and the digital displays show the separate peak currents as they occur and their values are coded onto punched paper tape. The punched tape, carrying results from several samples of the rock, is fed into a computer into which all the other analytical data has been fed too. Here's the readout. That's the sample we saw being prepared. and the computer calculates for us the age of the rock. Three thousand seven hundred and seven million years old. This and other rock dating techniques are used by Dr. Stephen Moorbath and his colleagues in this department. What geochronologists are trying to do is to set up a historical time scale for the physical, chemical and biological processes that have shaped the surface of the Earth from its beginning to the present time. Many rocks can be dated by these techniques, which actually contain fossils. So if one dates a rock which contains a fossil, then one knows how old the fossil is, how long ago that organism actually lived. This is a particularly interesting rock, and it comes from Rhodesia. It's been dated at about 2,800 million years and it's one of the oldest known rocks which actually contains fossils. These fossils are the remains of very primitive plants called algal stromatolites or blue-green algae. 
uh, most of these samples actually come from Greenland and they are some of the oldest uh, known rocks on the surface of the earth. This one's of particular interest here, this sample, and it represents a sediment that was laid down underwater about 3,700 million years ago. And there's a lot of debate going on at the present time whether life existed at the time that these rocks were deposited. And many scientists are currently investigating these rocks to see uh, not so much uh, whether they can find real fossils, but whether they can find organic compounds which have been derived by the breakup of living organisms. So at 3,700 million years ago, it's just possible that life was beginning on this planet. The film you're watching runs for 20 minutes. Let's suppose that this represents the time since the Earth was formed. Then the last 2,000 years of our history would be a tiny, tiny sliver, too thin to be seen, right at the end of the film. Each frame represents about 130,000 years. And the beginning of man would be about 15 frames from the end of the film, two million years, with all this time before he appeared. Interpreting fossil evidence is like trying to piece together the whole film from tiny, occasional, broken bits. And of some sequences in the film, there may be no traces at all. Even so, this evidence from the past is very valuable. At the Museum of Northern Arizona, the distinguished American paleontologist, Professor Edwin Colbert. Now, what is the value of fossils when we're discussing evolution? Uh, I think the uh, real importance of fossils is that they bring in the fourth dimension, well, yes, the fourth dimension of time. No other evidence for evolution brings in this time sequence. And in the, in the fossils we have the succession through time of various forms of animals and plants, and we can follow that succession. For example, uh, evolution of the horse is a very famous example of evolution and uh, change through time. Admittedly, there are gaps in, in the record, but those gaps in some cases are quite inconsequential. I think that's the case in the evolution of the horse. In other cases, there are greater gaps. But even so, I think it's quite valid to project back from one form to another where we can see the uh, anatomy, the physio the anatomy of the animals changing through the sequence of geologic time. A very uh, good example of uh, this is seen in the evolution of the birds. There's good reason to think now that the birds are descended from the dinosaurs. And we have this famous fossil known as Archaeopteryx, which is a ancestral bird. We have imprints of the feathers in the rock right along with the, with the skeleton. And yet that skeleton, if the feathers had not been found, I think would almost certainly have been classified as a dinosaur. Here we have the evolution of a major group, a major category, you see, and it's preserved in the fossil record. In the next two films, we shall look in detail at some of these fossil series. We shall see how fossils are discovered and interpreted, and some of the things they tell us about living things in the past, and the light which they throw on living things today.